looks like. Well, let's hope Belgium, let, let's hope Belgium does not win, even if they win, it makes no difference because um, um, England has already qualified for the next round. And I'm saying that with a heavy heart because I saw some of my African teams didn't make it. Uh, but we are generous, you know, we just wanted to make sure others go, you know. And, uh, but it's not a, not a good feeling, but uh, we can live for the next four years and see what happens um, after that. Um, <coughs> just looking at and thinking about the England, the, the England squad, you seem to have some good players, young and very carefree and very excited and hungry, hungry for success. And uh, your your captain there, what's his name? Kane, is it? Is this Harry or William? Okay, um, he he seems to be leading in the front. You know, he seems to be um, putting all things together. And uh, with how many goals already? I think he's somewhere there, one of the top. Um, he's doing well, and we wish we wish you all the best. You know, it's so interesting how we put so much stress on leadership. I mean, as the captain, it's so interesting how we put so much stress. He may not be the best player, but obviously he's the captain because he's, he has good leadership. He has good leadership st skills, and he's a, he can galvanize, he can bring the, the team together. And, and that's the beauty of, of, of leadership. And by the way, I've been asked to, to talk to you about leadership. I've been asked to talk to you about leadership. And a very interesting subject um, on, on leadership. And, and some of us may think of leadership in a formal way. And maybe I should come down here. I feel I'm so far away. I don't know. Do you mind if? Okay. I'm a shy person, you know, so if I get closer, then I can get your warmth, and then it, it, it will help me. Uh, I'm saying leadership, you can look at leadership as a formal thing that I'm going to be a leader, CEO of a company, or I'm going to be a principal of an academy or primary school or whatever. Um, and you look at that, but generally, you are a leader. Whether you are paid for that leadership role or not, when you look at leadership in terms of influence, that you may have three friends, and if you influence them in the, in the right direction, you have led. Leaders basically use their influence to, to make a difference. So you are a leader in one way or the other. It would be a sad uh, uh, commentary about your life if you were to leave and you are 50, 40. When do you plan to die? Let me see. But it just be part of your plans. Then I die. You know, like, go to uni, get married, have children, and then die. And it has to be part of your... <laughs> 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 it, ought be, it ought to be part of your plans because if you don't have death somewhere there... Let me tell you, this is very serious. If you don't have death at the end... It makes your life to be very reckless. If you are not aware of your demise, you tend to be very reckless. You need to also plan for your death. Uh, there's a book by Sobukwe. I don't know how many of you know Sobukwe. One of the uh, freedom fighters in South Africa. He died early on during the whole struggle. There's a book on his bi biography. It says, How to Die. How to Die. Now, once you know that there's death, and then the next thing is going to be, How am I going to die? Because as you live, you are dying, but how are you living? Because as you live, you are dying. So you need to be, you need to put death somewhere at, as part of your plans and then die. Um, but if, if, if you die and, and, and all we say as part of your obituary, he was a follower. I mean, that's not nice. We do not celebrate followers. In life, we don't celebrate followers. Even though Cain may be the captain. But if you do your best in your position there, you sort of live as a leader. Even though you may not be the overall leadership for the whole team, but you are also recognized as a leader in your role that you play to a greater or lesser degree, you are also regarded as a leader. Now, some of you are going to be leaders in your families as parents. You're going to be leading in your companies, maybe a CEO, but at some point or another, leadership is going to hit you hard because life is about leadership. I know I may be... Uh, overemphasizing this. Life is about leadership. I was looking at certain things on leadership and um, on what I need to share with you when it comes to leadership. Um, I'm, I am 57. 
years of age. I know that my certificate says I was born in 1961, so that would correct some of, some of those things you don't know because you were not there when you were born. So, but it says it was 1961, so I'm around 57. Uh, sometimes you discover that's not even your right. I mean, you, people have just made that discovered. No, you were born two years earlier or two years later. It's just that we were to say 61 because of these other reasons. But around 57, I'm going to be turning 58 in September. I think I'm going to die around 95 or 96, right about there. If it goes to 100, that's a bonus. Um, I've, I've enjoyed my life, and uh, it has been beautiful. But I'm going to tell you something that I don't have. I don't have money. All right? So don't come to me for any sponsorship. I don't have money. And now, the question is, am I a good leader if at this stage I don't have money? When I, th when I say I don't have money, I don't mean I'm poor. I just mean I, I'm, not, I'm not ranked in the Forbes list of, of, of 2018 um, um, so much wealth. I'm not, I'm not even counted as those who have wealth. I just have a bank balance, but it's not called wealth. <laughs> so I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm, I'll take care of myself when I die. But I don't have a lot of money. But can I ask you a question? Am I a, am I a leader? Am I, am, I, am I a good leader if I don't have money? I'm asking this question because I was looking at three things. I was looking at leadership, and then I'm looking at success, then I'm looking at wealth. I look at the greatest leaders and the greatest successful people and the greatest people with wealth. In other words, the wealthiest and the most successful and the, and the greatest leaders. Somehow in this list of one, two, three, you'll find that most of the people who are in list of great leaders, they are not in the list of the most successful. And those in the list of successful, they're not in the list of the wealthiest. But what, which one do you want? What do you want in life? Do you want to be a great leader? You want to be successful? You want to be wealthy? Please just pretend as if you are, you are with me here. Which one do you want? Do you want to be the wealthiest or the, suc the most successful or the greatest leader? Successful. Because, I mean, if you are successful, it would, it would mean maybe even in your finances you are successful. It would mean also even in your career, you are successful. But for some reason, I look, for example, at the greatest leaders of all time in the whole world. They will have people like Mahatma Gandhi is number one. And the last one will be Vladimir, uh, Vladimir uh, Lenin. Believe it or not, he's in the top ten in the world, in the history of the world. So number one is Mahatma Gandhi. And the last one, they, it doesn't matter. The character may not have been the best. He may have been the dictator. But they look at the leadership skills and say, this guy galvanized and he achieved the purpose and he lived for something. And, and it, he actually influenced and changed uh, the paradigm and affected uh, some serious radical change in his life. So you've got Mahatma Gandhi. You've got, on the extreme end there, you've got Vlad Vladimir, uh, not, not, not um, um, what's his name, Lenin. And then in between, you have people like, Alexander the Great is there. You've got Napoleon Bonaparte is there. You've got George Washington. Americans will never forget themselves there. George Washington is there. Abraham Lincoln is there. Franklin Roosevelt is there. Winston Churchill is there. Uh, there are no Africans there. <laughs> no, but I'm talking about the top ten of all time. I'm I mean, that's the list. If you Google this, you, you're not going to find it. But in the last century, in the last century, he's there. But for some reason, there's a list where he doesn't appear. It's like we've always been led as Africans, so we, we don't have. But when you look at the, 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 in the century, we talk about leaders in the century. Then you've got people like Mandela. Um, you'll be there. And then, and, then, and then probably others. But I think there are, there are a good African leaders. Um, it's just that we don't know so much about them. Because you see, the, the media also makes you. If the leader is not focusing on your strength and your greatness, nobody's going to know about you. But it doesn't mean you're not a, you're not a leader. So the reason you guys don't know me is that because the media hasn't been focusing on me. But <laughs> 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 I mean, there's a guy like Kagame from, from Rwanda. He's, he's not the saint, but look at what he has done. Few years after genocide, he took over and he's been there for the last uh, years. But he's made a serious change. When you have time, go to Rwanda, the cleanest thing in the world, one of the cleanest in the world. Once you see cleanness, don't think it ends there. It means there's order. It means there's accountability. There's less corruption. All of those things. That cleanness is a is a symbol of a system that is working. 
in Kagame is there. 2020 vision. He has, he has three points there, and, and they are on point. They are hitting those. They want to excel. They want to instill pride. If you go to, after 20 years of genocide, the, the, the Tutsi and the, and, the, and the Hutu, you go there and uh, you ask a guy, are you a Hutu or Tutsi? He says, no, I'm a Rwandan. You see, they've instilled this, this identity. I'm not a Tutsi. I'm not a Hutu. I'm not defined by my tribe. I'm defined by my country. I'm a Rwandan. So that there will never be a genocide again there. Because there's no Rwandan will fight another Rwandan. But once you have got the Tutsi Rwandan and a Hutu Rwandan, then you've actually created the potential for chaos and, 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 and war and all these other things. Beautiful. I mean, I've been in that country once or twice. It's beautiful. I mean, they've got their challenges here. And some people, some, some, a friend of mine was saying, ah, don't talk to me about Rwanda. He, in the last vote, he had 99%. Even Jesus Christ couldn't get 99% for, for, for his election and stuff. I said, I don't care how much it gets. We can't let the West define to us what democracy is. It's not democracy because I got 51%. Even if I get 100%, who cares? What's important is what goes out there. They've got Trump in America with all the votes and the democracy. I don't know what's happening there. I'm not talking about that, but here's the point. <laughs> I'm sorry, delete that one. That was, that was not, that's not in the script. Uh, <laughs> they are, yeah, he's a good guy, I think. Um, 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 but there in his own corner, I don't need him in my corner. So, they are good leaders in Africa. Um, for whatever reason, they may not be as, as Mandela is, is a good leader, but it depends where you say that. There are quarters where they feel that he's sold out. So it depends, really, honestly. Um, but then I look at good leaders and then successful people. Then you've got Bill Gates, um, successful. Bill Gates, you've got uh, who else is in the successful? Um, Richard Branson is also in the successful. Also, uh, yeah, it's successful. You'll find Richard Branson in the, in the successful and many others. But some of those who are in the successful are not in the leadership. So this is something who can be successful. I don't know how they measure success. I still have to read. But you have to, we can be successful but not be a great leader. But be successful. But then I looked another list of the wealthiest. And some of the wealthiest are not in the successful list. Because this guy, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, who is supposed to be the richest, the first century billionaire, is the first one to reach $100 billion. Uh, he has overtaken, um, um, who's this? Bill Gates. Is it Bill Gates? Yeah, Bill Gates. Bill Gates is number two. That's the Forbes 2018 billionaire, whatever. Um, that's where some of us appear. So he, <laughs> Jeff Bezos is $112 billion US dollar, um, wealth. That's, that's his wealth. That's, 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 man, you can't, even, you can't even write that thing down. I mean, it's, it's just too much. That's wealthy, but he doesn't appear as, great, as a great leader. I don't know. If you have a lot of wealth, maybe you should be a great leader. I don't know. He doesn't appear as a great leader. Um, who is Steve, Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs was there on the successful. Um, Richard Branson is, is, I mean, somebody was, um, R Richard, Branson, Richard Branson is in the successful. Those, I mean, Virgin thing, Virgin Everywhere, Virgin Active, Virgin Atlantic. But all those things, he's, he's, he's done it success. So you can learn a lot from those guys. Um, you can learn a lot from the guys who are successful. I'm not sure if you can learn a lot from guys who are wealthy. Some of the wealthy guys are criminals. I don't know whether you can. <laughs> That's true. I mean, you, I don't know how, you can how much you can learn or maybe not to be a criminal. But then you've got success. You've got leaders, great leaders. You've got, you've got successful. You've got, you've, got, you've got wealthy. And if you can put them together and throw them in a hat and pick up one, I'm sure you will learn something that can, that can help you. Either to be a great leader, to be successful, to be wealthy. It's a short life, beloved. It's going to come to an end. And because of the fact that's going to come to an end, it must matter. Anything that comes to an end must have meaning. If this pillar will always be here, oh, the pillar is doing something, so there's a purpose. But if, 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 if you're going to live forever, it's difficult to look for meaning. Because meaning is evaluated at the end. If you're going to live forever, when are we going to assess your contribution? We will never, because you're living forever. Now, because there's going to be an end, it infuses, inject, it injects meaning into your life. Because you know there's going to come a time where I must give an account. I must be able to say, this is the score. This is how we have scored. 
because it has come to an end. And maybe that's the reason why Moses says in Psalms 19, by the way, it's Moses who says that, and I like that. He says, uh, teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. When you know the shortness of your days, how short your days are. That's the thing about young people. You know, Bible says, remember uh, uh, your creator in the days of your youth. You know why? In the days of your youth. Because at my days, in my days now, I don't need to be told to remember my creator because I know I'm going to die. I can smell the grave. Once you reach 50, <laughs> 50, 57, there's some like affinity. I mean, when you go past the funeral, the graveyard is like, Hish. you know, you feel like, <laughs> you feel like this thing is calling me. <laughs> It's calling me. There are voices that are calling me. Come. Your time is near. So, so there's no way I can forget my creator. Because my age itself just reminds me. You know, there were times where I could just go and pick up something. Oh, no, I'm, I'm maybe exaggerating. Maybe, maybe it's still in my mind. But I struggled. The other day, I was like doing one exercise I used to do when I was young. You know, you go on your, on your, on your arms and you put your, you put your feet on the, on the wall. Uh, and then you balance yourself with your arms. I thought I could do that. I haven't done that for years, but I used to do it easily. Then this time I was just, I thought my whole body was breaking. I said, what has happened? Yes, life. I don't need to be reminded. Which each time I go to the kitchen, I see supplement for this, supplement for that, supplement for that, supplement for this, supplement for the supplement. There's all, all, all kinds of supplements. I can tell that I need a creator because I'm going the way of all kings. But when you are young, you think you'll be forever young. You think you are God. There was a say when I grew up in Google, it came to, and in, uh, where, that's where I grew up, where we used to say, Scotch never dies. He dies by mistake. You know, Scotch is supposed to be this guy, you know, this guy. You know, I don't know how you, I would, I would know how you, how you, uh, uh, you call these guys, but we call those guys like the guys who have it all, like the guys who are wise, street wise, and they seem to have answers for little things here and there. They, 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 they are there. We call those scotch. And the saying then will say, scotch never dies. These guys, they don't die. If they die, it's by mistake. But here's the thing, they died. Even though it was a mistake, they died. And all of them died by a mistake, but they all died. There's something about young people and youthfulness, which is beautiful. And this thing that says, I will live forever. You don't need any supplement. You just go in. You just go. You don't even need to warm up. <laughs> Some of us have to warm up. Even before you walk, you have to warm up. <laughs> Get the blood circulating so you can walk. But you guys just, you're gone. It's very tempting to think you are God as a young person. And the Bible says, listen, you're going to die. I know that makes things bad. But I mean, then that injects meaning and purpose in your life. Remember, the brevity of life creates excitement. It does. Just say, hey, this thing's going to come to an end. Let me enjoy it. I mean, if you are told that you're going to die in six months' time, the pace, your pace will change. You know what? Six months will change your pace. This way or that way, but it will change. Brevity forces, compels you to do things intentional and deliberate. And you begin to plan things as you know. You don't have a lot of time. Now, what am I going to say to you? Let me, I thought I should look at some of these big guys and extrapolate some principles, but I said, ah, that's not going to help you much. But there's some bad things that happened with those guys. Then I picked up Joseph. I said, here's our guy. Let's for now think he's the best guy in the whole world. We're going to focus on him. I want to pick up some few things in the life of Joseph. Now, I'm not saying you must be like Joseph. When we talk about Joseph and we're looking at those principles about Joseph, I am encouraging you and I am motivating you to be more than Joseph. When you learn from someone, you don't learn so that you can be like him. You learn so that you can be better than him. Actually, that's the reason why we learn. We learn not to be like. Now, if I'm a teacher and I teach you and I teach you, if I am successful if you become better than me. But if you can only be like me then, then I've become an absolute standard. That's what we'd say also in leadership, Pastor. <laughs> I said this and people didn't like it. Uh, we were inaugurating a, 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 a president at one of our colleges. And I said to the one that's coming, you and the one that was the, the incumbent, the one there that was there but was no longer this one, I said, you must be better than this one. 
You must be better than him. That's why you, you've been brought in here. So you can be better than him. We don't want you to be like this guy. Maybe that looks like, oh, what was wrong with me? Uh-uh, you were okay. But we brought this one. We brought this one. Now this one is here. And this one must be better than you. Otherwise, there's no progress. If after this leader, we have another leader who's like this other leader, there's no progress, beloved. A leader, if I'm a leader and I move, and the person who comes after me must be better than me, I must feel sad if he does what I was doing. Then we have not moved. Because you know what? If I had remained, I would have done better if I had remained. So if you come in and I go, please do better. Actually, that's a biblical principle. Those who come after us must be better than us. Otherwise, there's no progress. So if we learn from Joseph, it is because God wants us to be better than Joseph. The reason we've got the story of Joseph in the Bible, it is not because God wants to produce other Josephs or Josephine. No, that's not the whole reason. <laughs> that's not the, the reason we have Joseph as a, as a study, as a case study. Is so that we can be better than him. Learn from him, be better than him. Because remember, we learn from Joseph, we learn from David, we learn from Abraham. At the end, we're better than Abraham, better than David, better than Joseph. So I give you Joseph, not because that's the, that's the, that's, that's the standard. But I say, as you, as you go, take this from him. You can take from others and you'll be better. The greatest standard, and I wanted to do that, but I said, ah, they'll, they'll just sleep and say, ah, he's going to bore us. I thought I was going to talk about Christ as the greatest leader. And we look and extrapolate principle from him. I said, we all do that every time when we preach the sermon. Let's rather talk about Joseph. Now, Christ is your ideal because you can never be better than him. It's like this Japanese concept. You'll always be striving and becoming better and striving and becoming better, but you can never actually reach the this, this, this standard. And it is that reaching and, and extending and, and reaching and, and trying to, to, to get to that makes you develop, and that's Christ, the standard. All right. All right, let's move away from that. Then look at Joseph. Now, what comes out when we read the story of Joseph? It comes, the whole story comes to me from the book of Genesis and 39, it comes even before 39, it goes all the way to chapter 50. It's all about Joseph. Here and there, he's in the, it's not in the picture, but it's all about Joseph. It, he ends in chapter 50. He comes into Lamnite in chapter 39. Of course, even in chapter 37, you'll all you'll see him there, preparation, but he becomes the guy in chapter 39. And this is how it is, the whole thing about Joseph is introduced, which to me is exciting. It's amazing. If you want to be a successful person, if you want to be a great leader, uh, if you want to be wealthy, but I, I always struggle if your goal is to be wealthy. And then what? Now you have money, then you are dead, so what? <laughs> We're wealthy cops. Now, but, but <laughs> I'm not saying we shouldn't have, but I think, I, think, I think, yeah, let it be there, but there are other things more important than wealth. Because some of the greatest leaders have never had money. Christ, I don't, know, I don't know how much money he had in the bank, but he was the greatest leader. All right. Joseph. In verse 2, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. And then it says, and he was a successful man. Full stop. Another version says, and he was a prosperous man. Can I give? Can I? Can can I? Can I submit to you, beloved, that uh, Joseph's story ends in that sentence? That's it. The rest that you read about Joseph is a commentary. What happens when a man is said to be with Jesus? What happens when God is with a man? That's the commentary. But the story ends in that sentence. He, the Lord was with him, and he was successful. Full stop. Go to the next person. But then we'll have to stop and say, hey, let's explain. Look at the life. What do we mean when we say he was successful? So that's the commentary. Everything you read now is just defining what it means to be successful. But that's not all, but at least some of it, what it means to be successful. But I want, I want, I want us, even before we look at those things, I want us to see the intentionality in the statement, and the Lord was with Joseph. It is not just a statement like, the Lord was with me. It is, <laughs> it is, it is intentional. It is very strategic. It is, it is a, it is a serious theological statement. When the Bible says 
the Lord is with an individual. It's not a, in a generic sense. I'll tell you why I'm saying that. It is because before Joseph landed in Egypt, before, if you feel like you're drowsing, that's normal. You're a human being. There's nothing to do with your spirituality. So just stand. Because if you stand, you can't sleep when you're standing. Just stand. Because you're doing something that fights against sleeping. <laughs> All right, so just stand. Because I know the reason you are here because you want to, to listen to this. So I need to help you also. Um, so stand, feel free to stand and walk around and then come sit down because you're already here. Don't, don't put this thing to waste that you are here because you came here. If you didn't want to come here, you would be sleeping. That's why you came here. So make it count. If you feel like you, I'm, I also feel drowsy at times as I speak, but I keep moving. Then I'm fine. <laughs> Here's the intentionality in the story of in the story of in the story of Joseph. Before that verse, you don't find a single statement that says the Lord was with Joseph. None. When Joseph was thrown in the pit there by his brothers, there's no statement that says that the Lord was with him. None. But move away. Fast forward. When he was thrown, when he was sent to jail, then it says and the Lord was with him. So what's the difference between the jail and the pit? Why don't we find an expression that says, and the Lord was with Joseph in the pit? But we find a statement that says, and the Lord was with Joseph in prison. Why the difference? Because when the Bible says the Lord is with you, okay, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me back up a little bit. The Lord was with Joseph in the pit in a generic sense, like he's, he, he is with his creek. Creation. You don't need to say that. You don't need to write it. Once you write it, this you are adding another level. And this is the level I want to I want us to 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 get to. When the text says the Lord was with Joseph, then it forces us to assume, rightly so that this Lord being with Joseph expression, phrase, took place before Joseph landed in Egypt. Because this is verse 2 in chapter 39. He lands in Egypt, and the next thing we hear, and the Lord was with him. All right? If the Lord is with him, in the pit, we don't hear the Lord is with him. In Egypt, we hear the Lord is with him. So back up a little bit. It took place on the way to Egypt. And those of you who read um, Ellen G. White books, if you read Patrick's and Prophets 214, it will give you a nice a shortcut to this thing. We can make it long, but it will give you a nice shortcut. It says, on his way to Egypt, when he was looking at his prospects, when he was looking at the challenges he's going to face, moving from the known to the unknown, from the comfort to the uncomfortable, I'm paraphrasing, from home to a, a land of, of a foreign land, foreign culture that he never knew, from a small, humble, humble beginning to a great, uh, space in, in, in Egypt, um, one of the civilization of those days, and, and he, he had this foreboding. He had this fear. He says, how am I going to make it? And then it dawned on him that God is the God of Abraham. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Isaac. Wait a minute. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. But he's not called the God of Joseph. Then he says, on the, the text says, on his way to Egypt, he says, I want God to be the God of Joseph. And then he said that. Then he says, and the Lord was with him. The Lord will, the Bible, it, there will never be a subscript, there will never be a, 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 a statement that says the Lord is with you if you had not come to a point where you want the Lord to be with you. So it's intentional. So Joseph, right there on his way to Egypt, the Bible says he moved, he was a boy, but the moment he made that statement, he moved from being a petty child to a man possessed, a man who had a direction and purpose in life. And he knew that this, I've entered a stage now. It's either I make it or I don't. It's either I do it or I fail. This is it. This is the stage for me. And Joseph would never look back from that moment on. When he landed in Egypt, he said, Egypt, here I am, ready or not. You will never be the same again because I've come. He didn't enter Egypt like a refugee. He didn't enter Egypt like a slave. He entered Egypt with a man with a vision. 
Here you are looking at your future prime minister. <laughs> Just as he entered. Now, how do I know that? And the Bible says, now here's the author, the author of the book of Genesis says, and the Lord, he makes a comment, and the Lord was with Joseph, and Joseph was successful. Man. But the next statement says, and Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph. Now, now that now is mind-boggling. I understand that the Lord is with Joseph. I understand. But when Potiphar, who does not know the Lord, says the Lord is with him, then there must be something he had seen. Now, listen, Potiphar is, now you can say the Lord is with Pastor Pop because you're trying to be nice. But Potiphar, Potiphar didn't know the Lord. Potiphar didn't owe Joseph a thing. As far as he was concerned, Joseph was a slave and he paid money for him. Period. Are you with me? But, but when it says even Potiphar saw that, that means there must have been a time between the time when Potiphar saw Joseph and the time when he sees that the Lord is with him. Potiphar could see Joseph, but it would take him time to see the Lord that is with Joseph by what Joseph does. So Potiphar says, I have had slaves. I have known people that have worked for me, but this one is different. The Lord is with him. But you can't even say that. How do you know? How do you know that if a person behaves like this, it is because the Lord is with him? How do you know that? I'm asking you, beloved. How did Potiphar know that the Lord is with Joseph? His conduct. Come again. Yes, he made everything to proper in his hand. But my question is, if everything proper is in your hand, does that mean the Lord is with you? You can say in this context, but remember, Potiphar was not a, 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 a Yahweh. He was not a worshiper of Jehovah. So there's no way he's going to attribute success to God. He would, if there's success, he'll attribute to his own God. Are you with me? But, but, but what moves Potiphar to a point where he actually says, the Lord is with Joseph? What would have happened? What, what would make that? This is a principle that is very important for us to grasp right now, that, that we are working on now. What made Potiphar to say that? Eh? Yeah, commandments of God. But remember, the commandments of God, but you, you, you're on the right track there. The commandments of God, yes, but Potiphar then would say, the Lord is with him. You see, he's not saying it regrettably. He's saying it with excitement that the Lord is with him. Because, of, like, like you say, he can see the, 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 the difference. When the, when the Lord is with you, you make a difference, honey. You make a big difference. You really do. When the Lord is with you, you don't go around mimicking other people. Kairoki. What do you call that thing? Karaoke. What do you call that thing? Yeah. You don't spend your life doing Kairoki, whatever that is. When the Lord is with you, you imitate God, no one else. Actually, elsewhere in the book of education, I think it's page 17, of, of, if not, forget it. But it's there in the book of education, you can look for it. The early chapter, it says, the aim of true education is to train youth to be thinkers with you. They'll think twice, but let them know if they don't. The Lord is with me. How can I do this and sin against God? Joseph did not say, I don't want to be pregnant. I still have to finish my school. He says, no, I don't care even if I'm not going to be pregnant. I don't want to do this thing. God hates it. We need to have God in our hearts to be able to stand and live a consistent life. You can't say no until you've said yes to Jesus. Because your no is just a not yet. You know when people have not accepted Christ, all they say is not yet. Because I'm still studying, not yet. So what, what you are saying is not wrong. It's just that not now, not now. When you have Jesus, it's a no. It's a resounding no because there's a yes. You see, when you tempt me on my yes, a no is possible because there's a yes. The problem with some of us, there is no yes in our lives. Have a big yes, and that opens the way for a yes, a no. No, because your proposition is against my yes. Make a yes before you can confront a no. You can say no because there's a yes in your life. And Joseph ran. <laughs> he ran. There's some of us who say, Jesus, help me. Oh, come on, get out. <laughs> you know, we need to teach our young people how to live a, a very aggressive and fruitful Christian life. Stop loitering around temptation in the name of Jesus. Move. Get out. Move. If, if you went with your friends to a place and then you say, hey, things are changing. Come up with a story if you are weak. But get out of that place. Don't say, Jesus, be with me. Be with me. What? Get out. <laughs> there's time to pray and there's time to run. 
Joseph prayed every morning. This was not the time to pray. This was the time to run with that perfume, with that closeness. The woman got hold of, it's true, it's in the Bible. The woman got hold of him. He says, maybe your problem is proximity. Let me bring you closer. He says, then I'm running away. And he left the jacket. He left the jacket. He left the jacket. <laughs> Ran with the body. Because the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, not your jacket. So you can leave your jacket. You know, but here's the thing. Some of us don't leave the, don't leave the jacket. We leave the body and we run with the jacket. Because <laughs> the jacket is more expensive than the body. You know, I bought this jacket. I bought this jacket. I don't know what your shops are. But whatever shops, I bought this. So you run. People sell their body to buy a jacket. And he ran all the way to prison. You know, some of us run and we come back. Then you run and you come back. You, you peep through the window. Bring my jacket. Bring my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. Leave that thing there and go and disappear. In prison. Here's the last point. In prison. In prison, beloved. The Lord was with him. He stood for God in prison. There is nothing as painful as suffering for, uh, and, and facing consequences for something you did not do. There is nothing as painful as to be exposed to suffering when you were faithful to God. I have listened to stories. Breaks my heart. The young lady coming from the prayer meeting. She got raped on her way, on, on, on her way to, to home. And then he says, what was wrong with me going to the prayer meeting? Why did God not protect me? Why was I raped when I come from church? When bad things happen to good people. In prison. But he says, I don't know. But the Lord is going to be with him. And the Bible says, but the Lord was with him. To pull him through that. And here's the question. When these things happen to you, who will pull you through if the Lord's not with you? He can't, you can't start having the Lord in prison. You must also have him right there before you get to prison. So that when you walk into prison, you walk with the Lord. It was not long right there in prison. He showed his leadership skill. In prison, he was visiting all the inmates. Hey, what's up? Is everything okay? Hey, you look fine, man. Why you look, what, what's happened? No, I had a dream. What kind of a dream? That's how you got to know the dreams of the inmates. He was there as a leader. Very soon, the warder recognized that this guy is a leader. Let me make him a leader. In prison... And the Lord was with him. It was not long. Prison cannot keep you if you're a leader. It was not long. I said, get out of here. That's why the grave will, will, will not keep you if you die with, when the Lord is with you and you die. The prison will vomit you out. You see, you no, know, no, grave will vomit you out. Graves don't want people who can stand. Because everybody in the grave is sleeping. But if you, if you were standing when you are alive, grave will not be able to stomach you. That's why it will vomit you. Because God stomach you. You guys following my accent here. All right. <laughs> and then he was out of prison. But let me tell you something. It was, not only, it was only after two years that he was out of prison. After two years. Because God was not in a hurry. He says, I want you to learn what it means to be in prison. So that you'll never be afraid of prison in your life. The reason we can't stand for truth is because we're afraid of prison. Stay right there. Conquer that thing. As a leader, you conquer every level of your journey. Every level of your journey. Because every level makes you what you are in the end. Conquer that. I've got leaders in my country, in my, in my continent, who some of them were in prison. But they didn't conquer prison. But they were released. Now they are afraid of going back. They are so corrupt because they are afraid of going back. Prison can be poverty. If you didn't conquer poverty, you're going to be corrupt because you're afraid of poverty. Conquer that thing. You'll never be afraid of that. Some of you are single. Now, you can never hope to get married unless you conquer being single. Conquer that thing. Don't let anyone save you from being single. You don't need a savior as a husband. You don't need a savior as a wife. Whew, and he saved me. Singlehood was killing me. Listen, you've got to conquer that thing. So that when you get married, there should be no fear. Lest I become single again. No, if I have to become single again, I will do as I did last time. So I won't allow myself to be abused because I'm afraid of being single. Because I conquered being single. <laughs> you didn't hear me. All right, there's a last point, and this is it. Joseph, it turned out that in all his success, he never forgot that there's something better. A leader, once he thinks he has arrived, he starts to self-destruct. 
Joseph never arrived. At his deathbed, he said, when God comes to deliver you, take my bones with you. This guy regarded himself as a foreigner in Egypt, even though he was the prime minister, even though he was the, one of the second in, in, in charge, even though there were streets named after him. His last words were like treason. I don't want my bones here. And yet his Joseph Boulevard, Joseph University, Joseph Bridge, Joseph Cloud, whatever else that was in Egypt. Even the clouds were, were, were named after him. But when he died, he says, my bones will not remain here. You know what? When you, when, you cannot, uh, when you cannot compare your success with anything better than it, then your success begins to kill you. Now, one of the reasons why people who are successful begin to, to go down and use drugs is because they can't go anywhere else. This is the highest. Then they start dying. But when you compare your success and your beauty and your joy, and you compare with what God has prepared, and you see that this one is nothing compared to that one, this will never kill you because there's something better. You'll always be striving for that which is better. That's why the name of Joseph is found in Hebrews 11. He looked for a better city. Even though he was the greatest in Egypt, he looked for a better city. So because there is a better city, Egypt was, a rel was relative. It was never the best. And because of that, there was no way you could be conquered and consumed by Egypt because there was always the better city. Now, you're going to go and you're going to make it in life and you're going to be the biggest and the bettest and the brightest. Are you with me? But remember, the moment you forget about heaven, which is a better place than where you are, you will begin to self-destruct. Keep heaven in your mind that there's something better than this. There's something better than this. I'm the best, but there's something better than this. And you have that, you will keep growing until you die. I've got four seconds, three seconds, two seconds. Finish. It's not how you use your last time, your last minutes, counting them. <coughs> but I had to do that. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you very much.